Welcome to Civil Night. My guest is Garigin Papoyan. He is a professor at the University of Maryland and an expert in chemistry and biochemistry. Thank you for joining us, Garigin. Thank you very much. I appreciate your invitation. Mm -hmm. So you are from Armenia, but you studied at the Russian Academy of Sciences and then held your PhD at Cornell University in New York. Now you're a Monroe Martin professor with a joint appointment in chemistry and Institute for Physical Science and Technology. Could you tell us more about your work? So my work, uh, I'm a faculty at the University of Maryland and uh, in academia in the United States, um, uh, there are, we have two main functions. One is education. So I teach undergraduate students from first year, second year, up to fourth year. Also, I teach graduate students. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, so people that are doing PhD or master's work. Um, one thing that's important for us uh, at the research class university, like the University of Maryland, is to, um, to not so overload us with teaching so we can do research. And that's something that, again, in Armenia, I think people have to think about that because I, I think what, from what I know, their teaching loads at the university are too high. So for example, if I were to teach three classes a semester, I couldn't really do much research. I teach one and it's hard enough. So, so that's my teaching load. And then I have a research group. I have talented graduate students. They come from all over the world. It's very international. Uh, we, work, uh, we work on complex problems in biology, although our background is physics and mathematics, but we apply those techniques to solve problems in biology difficult things like how proteins fold, how DNA in our cells works. Um, and the last uh, five, seven years, our uh, main emphasis has been to build super complex computational models for how cells work. And our bodies are made from cells. And the cell is the first level when molecules become life. Before that, they are just molecules. But in a cell, they, the cell starts to move around and go after another cell. But these are just molecules. How does it happen? So. Uh, it, no one really knows the answer fully to this question. And the dream is next 10 years to build computational models based on chemistry and physics. So in a computer, you just throw molecules and then they start to interact with each other. And then when you see from the side, then the cell starts to move, goes and out after another cell does sensing and feels that this is not good, comes back. So, so that when we do that, we'll understand how our brain works because our brain is made from neurons. We want to understand how does a single neuron work? We don't really know very well. How does our immune system work? So at, at, at this moment in both of our bodies, there are billions of immune cells moving around, finding bacteria, eating them. It's like they're like mini robots. Like how does it work? Can we build something like that? So, so unless we have computational model, that's a molecular computational model, we'll never answer those questions. And my lab is one of the leading labs in the world that's pushing that direction. So you came to Armenia within the context of the DG, DG Week 2021 that aimed to build Armenia's future high-tech industries. You introduced a new and exciting project, um, the Biosim.ai. It's a laboratory that will operate here in Armenia with Armenian experts. You start to introduce the new initiative with one question, what's the problem with drug discovery? So, is this the question that led you to create the biosim.ai and what's all about? That's correct. So, uh, again, for people that are not experts in pharmaceutical development and you think that there are all these thousands of PhDs from famous universities, they know how to quickly do drug discovery with any disease. The answer is that it's still drug discovery even today is done in, in some sense in very old fashioned way that you just do lots of trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, and 99.9% and .9 of the time it doesn't work. So it's amazing those statistics when you just hear, when I learned the first time, I just couldn't believe that you do, for example, 100 projects and 99 fail. And it's not the 100 projects that you do in a week. It can take you years. You could have a team of 50 PhDs for several years. They work on it. They have good ideas. And then after five years, the project is closed because it just didn't work. That's because our bodies are so complex. Our biology is so complex. There's so much chemistry and biochemistry and biophysics and we still don't understand most of it or, or a lot of it. So, so that's the state of art today that uh, most of drug discovery is still very trial and error, very old fashioned, very labor intensive, takes many years. It, for every drug to, be, to go from the idea to the market, it takes 10 to 15 years, even today. Uh, it takes about $2 billion for a single drug. Uh, 
uh, as I said, and the reason is $2 billion is, is that 99 projects fail, one succeeds. But when you go and buy a drug, that one drug that succeeded, you have to pay for those 99 failures, right? Because who's gonna pay? So, so when a drug company comes and says, this, this treatment costs $100,000 a year, you say, that's like ridiculous. Like, why is it so expensive? That's because they had 99 projects that cost like billion dollars and they all failed. Like, we as a society have to pay for it. So, so that's the model of drug discovery today. And if you take diseases that we have that are all incurable, Alzheimer's, many cancers, lots and lots of diseases, and say, with the current speed of drug discovery, the current pace, how long will it take to cure them with modern science, AI, all the things that are around us? The answer is several hundred years. So we will not be around to see that. But we'd like to be around to see that, right? So, so that's, the, that's, the, that's the motivation to start something different or, or new. And BIOS and AI came out of that is, could we bring some new enabling technologies together that were never really brought together so then we can solve those problems, at least we can accelerate it maybe tenfold. So instead of 300 years to cure all diseases, we can maybe do it in 30 years. So, so that's the big dream about uh, new directions like bias and AI. And why did you choose Armenia and Armenia Next for this industry? So the company grew out of, uh, grew out of my um, sabbatical uh, stay in Armenia, so in 2019. In the US, professors every seven years, which is a wonderful tradition actually, uh, we are given a one-year opportunity to go any place in the world and, and get to meet new people, learn new things that we didn't know. So my one year, when the time came up for me, it's called a sabbatical, I split between University of Oxford, where I was a, 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 a visiting uh, Merton Fellow and, and lived in a castle and it was fun there with my family and kids. And then we came to Armenia for eight, nine months. And, and then I was here and out of that stay and interactions with people here, uh, there's a wonderful group here called SmartGate, which is a venture group doing very innovative investment, investing in, in breakthrough technologies, sort of thinking two steps ahead. So they, because I'm an academic, I need help from the business side for me to think how to start a company. I just have the scientific idea, right, technological idea. So they were very wonderful in helping to start the company during my sabbatical stay. And, and actually during that time when the COVID happened, so, so I was also, yeah, sort of uh, involved a little bit in sort of understanding how COVID spreads in Armenia and doing some calculations about that. So it was an interesting year. Okay. So um, if we talk about Armenia, what's lacking in the country in terms of chemistry and biochemistry? And if the country works hard to develop this field, um, what results can be achieved here in Armenia? And um, what impact can it have on the domestic and uh, foreign levels? Yeah, so uh, I am i don't have a comprehensive knowledge of what's the state of the state of affairs of chemistry and biochemistry. When I was a when I was a high school student, I'd actually go to the Department of Chemistry and, Bi and, and Biology here in the Yerevan State University. So I, I knew how that looked like. Uh, my understanding is that uh, all right, uh, that there are some problems with it in terms of how it developed after that. Um, I'd like to yeah, first say why it's important. Just the drug pharmaceutical industry is $1 trillion industry globally. $1 trillion every year. So that's an opportunity lost, right? So if you're not participating in that $1 trillion industry, then, 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 then you're not sort of getting something that maybe you could have, uh, you, Armenia could have been a big player. And it's not just pharmaceutical, right? Take material science. For example, energy technologies, batteries, solar cells. There are so many technologies that have to do, th that's chemistry, material science, applied physics, for example. And on the biochemistry side, it's all these life sciences, biotech. Um, so there are lots of wonderful opportunities in the world that uh, many countries, not all countries, participate in, in making discoveries. And then those discoveries lead to companies and, and it creates this ecosystem. Um, so having a vibrant chemistry community, and you can imagine that chemistry is also such an applied field. Anything from plastics to paint to, uh, to pharmaceuticals, to like if you look around you, there is nothing that doesn't involve some advanced chemistry. Like even just this, like even any surface will have something that, not, not actually some simple chemistry, but some, someone in some lab somewhere came up with this maybe nanoparticles, that there's something that we just take it for granted. 
but it's actually high tech. So of course our kids, I think, appreciate high tech when it's Apple products or, or, or AI or things like that. But there's lots of high tech in, around us that, uh, that came from uh, uh, research universities that focus on chemistry and biochemistry and biology. So that I think is important to have these fields developed. And uh, I think in Armenia, uh, my understanding is that uh, there's not a lot of it. Uh, and, and it's important, I think, to create some vibrant centers where young people, if you are a 20 year old and you want to become a chemist, it's not a strange thing. Like it's a, it's a great career. You could become an organic chemist that would come up with a molecule in a battery that will go into Tesla's and you'll become famous like kids should have should see those opportunities which I'm not sure if they do today so uh, I hope that um, that it will become creating such uh, basic science centers in physics too but also chemistry and biology will become a priority and both uh, private uh, industries that are already developed here in some areas but also the government can come together to recognize the critical importance of them, including also in defense, right? So they, all these uh, things, um, this basic fundamental research is gonna impact everything around us. And so, so uh, I think it will be, uh, it's something that also the whole society has to recognize that we have to make a sacrifice and pay a little bit even more, whatever, like, like every one of us has to contribute to having those uh, vibrant centers because it's important for the society. Well, my next and last question is pretty related to your answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So you are in the research field. You're a scientist. You're an academic. You just told us in 2013, you were interviewed by an Armenian media, Media Max. And you said Armenia was one of the leading republics in terms of science during the Soviet Union period, but still remains. The human resource is still rather big. And I see an important potential in this regard. It is clear Armenia is a country with limited resources, which can't fully cover all the branches of science, but there may be some priority areas where Armenia will play a leading role on the international arena. So you said that eight years ago, and since then nothing much uh, seems to very, very little has been done to achieve some positive change in uh, the science field. Could you please tell us why sciences uh, have become or where have always been uh, so crucial for a country such as Armenia. Yeah, it's a little sad that actually after eight years we have to have this conversation again. Um, I think there are few maybe bright spots that, like AI, for example, that uh, Armenia, especially on the private side, uh, there are some Armenian companies that are starting to make uh, waves on the international scene, and I think that's and young people have a place to go if you want to have a worldwide influence. Young people have a place uh, in companies like that to do innovation, for example, in AI. But of course, it doesn't go maybe too much beyond that. Uh, there are, all, all, although there are probably some narrow areas where also there has been progress. So uh, I don't want to, uh, because I don't know actually, I don't want to inadvertently diminish some big achievements that someone did, for example, at, at one of the universities. Um, but I think the Armenian society, I have a feeling, I follow Armenian news a little bit, uh, not that I, in, in extreme detail, but I have a feeling that lately the Armenian society starts to appreciate a lot more the role of both technology, first of all, but also science behind the technology. If maybe five years ago, people would have thought, oh, these are like, why it's a small country like Armenia should have science. Uh, I think it's sort of people, I hope that people start just to know that, that that's critical. In 21st century, which is the century of science and technology and, and, and high tech. If you are not, if you don't have it, then you're gonna be one of the countries left behind. So, so that's, that's the choice, right? Do you want to be like developing, going into 22nd century, or do you wanna be like somewhere in the backwaters? And I think, I, f I feel that the Armenian society now in particular has an ambition not to be left behind. And, and, and then science, and technology is the only way forward. There's no other way. And, and that's hard work, that, that's sacrifice, right? It's a sacrifice at every level of society and government, meaning that things that you could, resources you could do something important, still it's important enough that you should pay attention to having 
or in creating if you don't have one strong science and, and then technology around it. And if you look at uh, some small other countries that are successful in that way, I think we could maybe take those countries as role models that it's possible for small countries to have an amazingly strong science. And, and that actually we know will drive those countries to be, despite, despite their size, they'll be, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be very visible on the international scene and, and, and also contribute hugely to their societies being successful. So I hope that, uh, yeah, if we ha have a discussion like that in eight years, we don't have to have a similar, similar sort of yeah, yeah, theme that by then we'll have this vibrant science then uh, we'll talk about those achievements maybe. Hopefully you're, uh, it would be the way you just described. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Papoyan, for this talk. Thank you for watching and continue to follow CivilNet.